beautiful evening. We've had some beautiful weather in Michigan, um, hearing a lot of birds singing. So we're really excited to have you here for our webinar all about birding by ear. Um, and we are excited to have back um, Aaron Parker from the Belle Isle Nature Center um, to present for us. My name is Sarah Helson. I am the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon an organization dedicated to fostering the appreciation and conservation of birds and the environment that we share. We could not do the work we do without our funders and members. And so I wanted to make a special thank you to all of you who are members and are supporting projects yeah. like these. Um, some real quick Zoom housekeeping we still need to do before we begin. You're able to control your video and your microphone in the bottom left of your screen. So we ask that you keep yourself muted so we don't receive feedback from your microphones. You can also see closed captioning if you click on the live transcript on the bottom of your screen. And you can open the chat box by clicking on the chat button on the bottom of your screen. We will have time, time for questions at the end of the presentation. So please add any questions you might have into the chat. And we are also recording the webinar today and it will be shared via email in the next week or two for all of those who registered. If you have any further questions, please reach out to me. I'll do my best to assist you. So now I'd like to introduce Erin. Erin Parker grew up in Clarkston, Michigan, where her interest in the outdoors began, following a winding path from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan to the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. Erin has been a high school teach science teacher, worked at nature centers in three states, and happily came full circle to be connecting Michigan residents to nature with the Detroit Zoological Society. Erin is the Belle Isle Nature Center's manager and also serves as the field conservation officer. Thank you and welcome Erin. All right, thanks everyone. I am going to share my screen. Is that, do you see that? Yep, yep. Okay, it, usually there's a green line and I'm not seeing that. So thank you all for being here. Um, as Sarah said, I am the Field Conservation Officer and Nature Center's Manager for the Detroit Zoo. And I have been birding um, since I was six, since I was a little kid, um, off and on. And my very, very favorite thing to do is to um, connect especially new birders to birding. Um, so tonight I want to just talk for a moment before I uh, start the actual presentation. Um, I think it's really important to note that anyone can be a birder. Um, so I wear hearing aids. Uh, I have some genetic hearing loss, which is a bummer, but it is what it is. And I still bird by ear. Um, so my very favorite thing is connecting people to the birds in their backyard and helping you um, kind of figure out what's out there and understand it and appreciate it. And so very excited to be here. Um, we're gonna go over some very common backyard birds that are here right now. Then I'm gonna share some birds that um, haven't arrived in Michigan yet. If you're in the upper Midwest, they're, they're, they're not here quite yet, they'll be here soon. And they're birds that people always ask about and want to see. And if you learn their calls, that can be one way to find them, observe them, note that they are in your neighborhood. And then we'll do just a couple of, there's an owl and a hawk and an eagle, just because I think there's some interesting things to, um, to be hearing and listening for. And we'll also talk about the ethics of birding by ear and, and when and when not to use uh, playback. And I can talk about that a little bit more later. Um, if you have questions that don't get answered during this time or something comes up later, you are always welcome to reach out to me. I get lots of bird related questions in my email every day and I, uh, I really enjoy it. Um, and so I'm really glad that you're all here tonight. So why learn bird songs? Um, so first of all, it adds so much enjoyment to being outdoors when you are focused on what is making the noise that you're hearing, whether it's the owl that you're hearing outside your bedroom window at night, um, whether it is uh, being out in the yard and thinking, what is that call? And then looking up and having this, this beautiful bird here. Um, we had evening gross beaks in our backyard um, just one day. And one of the reasons we recognized it is because their call was different and it stood out from everything else. And this was in at the end of October of 2020. Um, and it's a fun way to engage with birding. So again, everyone can be a birder, whether you're using binoculars, whether you're um, sitting at your kitchen table, there are so many entry points to birding and birding by ear can be one of them um, because you don't need optics to go birding by ear and you can enjoy your birding experience just as much as someone who's spending a ton of time out in the woods um, using binoculars to track down every warbler. 
Uh, so we're going to go over a lot of calls. I don't expect that everyone on here knows any of them or that you'll leave knowing all of them. That, that's a lot for our brains to process. What I hope is that I can give you some tools, um, some tricks, and some help with the most common ones, and you start building a framework and sort of a memory for those calls so that as the birds start returning in the spring, you uh, are able to help identify them and, and enjoy your spring migration even more. Uh, and don't hesitate to put any questions in the chat and Sarah can help answer them or she can stop me. Um, I was a high school teacher. I'm not afraid of interruptions. I can, I can answer them now or later, um, but I don't wanna move past something if you're confused or if I say something or do something that is um, not helpful to you. So usually I don't give people the names of the birds right away, but for most of this lecture, I have the names built in after the first couple of slides because I don't want you to be trying to remember what that bird is and trying to learn its song at the same time. So we're gonna start with the red-winged blackbird and I'm gonna ask you to put in the chat, why do birds communicate? What, what is happening when we're hearing them making noises? And Sarah, maybe you could read a few out, unless I can find the chat again here. <laughs> Establishing territory, okay. finding a mate, communicating with mate and each other, warning or inviting birds, declaring territory. Awesome. Yeah, so I think we covered a lot of things. So a lot of what we hear is beautiful bird song is um, setting up a territory, warning away other particularly male birds. So it's really important to note that many female birds sing and some of them have different songs than the male birds. So this is an area that hasn't been um, studied a whole lot until recently, but female birds have a lot of communication. Some of them duet with them, their male mate. Some of them have their own series of calls and songs. Um, so we're often hearing territoriality uh, I am going to try to play this one. Are we still hearing bird calls? Okay. So, play this one. Actually, getting a couple of songs in there. Um, okay. So, a lot of what we're hearing right now is is bird communication, whether it's a male setting up a territory. And for those of us that live in a place with lots of red-winged blackbirds, the, sorry, I didn't mean to hit that again. The males returned several weeks ago and the females are now here. So the males have established their territories. If you live anywhere near a wetland or have a bird feeder, you've probably been seeing and hearing a lot of these birds. And look at his posture while he's calling. He's puffed up his big uh, epaulettes on his shoulder, the red and yellow patches are. Um, and then he's uh, calling and singing. Um, you know, he's making himself big and bold. So he is saying, this is my territory. Uh, you know, keep out if you're a male, welcome if you're my mate. Um, so that is one form of communication. Let's do, this is another. Um, Another bird that returned pretty early. Uh, this is our killdeer. And that is a neat one because it says its name, so we can remember that. But this bird does a lot of communication to other birds and other animals about danger. Someone's coming near my, uh, you know, my nest, these birds nest on the ground. The female here is um, feigning a wing injury. So she's gonna make a lot of noise and flap a wing. And if you're a fox or a dog or a cat, maybe you're gonna follow her away from the nest. She's gonna lead you away. This is a kill deer, um, just like it sounds, K-I-L-L-D-E-E-R. I promise I have the names of the rest of the birds in here. Um, and it's gonna sort of use that calling to communicate danger or warning and lure you away from the eggs or young which are on the ground and then she's going to fly away because her wing is not actually injured. So lots of ways to communicate. Birds also communicate to their young. Um, so especially as those fledglings are um, growing up they're going to communicate a, a, very, a lot and loudly to their adult um, to feed them. So you can often find birds that way. The adults also have calls to their young 
Um, we're going to get at the end towards some of the things that birds do to call um, out to other birds and say there's a predator, there's danger, um, and how we as bird watchers and bird listeners, I guess, could uh, utilize that to our advantage to find birds. Um, okay, so we're going to talk just a second about some tools for learning, and I will get to some specifics at the end for things that you could you could use at home to get better at bird calls too. Um, but there's a couple of things that are really handy. Um, whoops. Uh, as we're in the woods and looking and listening for birds. Um, and one of them, let's see, I thought I had it on this slide. So one of them is pishing. Um, and the word is P-I-S-H-I-N-G. And I very much thought it was something that my dad made up when I was a kid, but it is actually a well-known thing that birders do. And it's almost exactly what it sounds like. It's making a psh, psh, psh sound with your lips. Um, sometimes people do a sort of kissing sound and it sort of mimics a scold sound that many birds across um, many guilds of songbirds utilize. And you can be in the woods and hear a bird and think, I don't, I don't know what that is. And you can do a little bit of pishing and sometimes it'll come in and you'll get a better look at it. Um, it's almost as curious about you um, and wants to see what's going on or what's happening. So that is a tool that we can use with some judiciously. You don't want to do it a whole lot. And sometimes it doesn't work and it's not going to work with things like um, hawks or eagles or owls. Uh, that's just not the way that they use communication, but sometimes we can use our, our communication to, um, to get the, draw the birds in a little bit. The other thing, and we'll talk more about this, is playback. And so that is the idea of playing a call or a song to a bird. Um, maybe you're hearing it. Uh, people do this with owls a lot. Um, and you play in the call and the bird responds. And the bird might respond both vocally and physically by coming in. And so we'll talk at the end about when not to do that. But sometimes that can be a tool to help us, um, especially if we're really not sure what we're hearing um, or want to verify when we think we know what we're hearing. OK. Um, another tool that we're going to talk a lot about tonight is mnemonics, and that is a memory device. Usually it is a word or phrase. Um, sometimes I make my own up, and I'm going to encourage you to do the same because this has to help you learn the calls. So we're going to listen to this bird, and many of you probably already know what it is, but I will tell you at the end what it is. But at first we're going to listen, and if you don't know the mnemonic, See if you can listen to the call and set it to some words. Then I'll share what the official, if there's such a thing as an official mnemonic, I'll share that. Come on. Okay, so that one has a very clear, this is one of my all time favorite birds during migration and these, these birds will, will call a little bit in the fall and the spring. Um, and so it's very common mnemonic is oh sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. So I'm going to play the call again and I want you to look at that. The other common one is um, oh Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. So you're, you're sort of fitting the, the words to its call and I want you to, I'm going to play it one more time and we're going to listen for oh sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. There's a little lag, I'm sorry. Okay, so that was our white-throated sparrow. Um, and they are around. Uh, I had them at my bird feeder all winter. I still have them now. They're often on the ground, um, kind of kicking up the leaves. But start listening. I have not actually heard them start singing yet, but it should be any time now. Um, and see if you can pull out that song. They're loud. It's a beautiful, clear song. Um, it's a decent sized bird, but you're gonna, they're gonna be on the ground. Um, and so sometimes you hear the call before you even see the bird. So that can be really helpful. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, 
I picked a few really common ones that are doing a lot of calling. Uh, yeah, Deb, I see that you hear them at dusk and sunrise. I do too, although I will say, um, let me go back one. This one tends to call in the daytime too sometimes. Um, it's definitely part of the dawn and evening chorus, but this is a sparrow that doesn't, it does seem to call sometimes during the daytime. Oh yeah, that's neat. A white-throated sparrow is visiting in Tucson. <laughs> Um, with white crowned. Our white crowned don't typically stick around here. We'll get them for a few days in migration, but that's great. Um, so tufted titmouse, very common bird here. Um, they start calling in early Jan or I'm sorry, in late January, early February. Um, and they have a lot of different calls. Actually, I was out on Saturday in the woods and they were making a sound I had not really heard before. And it I was not sure what I was hearing, then it turned out to be tufted titmice. So the number one trick to learning bird calls, if you don't know the call, find the bird. And I, that's, so that's easier said than done, right? Um, but if you can watch a bird making its call, if you hear a bird calling and you can watch it, um, sorry, there's a lot going on here. Uh, if you can watch it, there is something that happens in your brain that helps you retain it. Um, so I have some issues with my hearing, so I don't get a lot of directionality with my hearing aids. So this is, this is not easy for me all the time to find the bird that's singing because I, I might think it's behind me because of the way my hearing aids work, but it's worth trying because if you can watch it sing, you can often retain that in a different way than birds that you're just hearing and not, and not seeing. I get it, not everybody can do that and that is totally fine. It's not the only way to learn them. Um, this time of year, if you are going to do that, is great because the leaves aren't out yet, at least where we are, and so you can find the birds a little bit more readily. So I'm going to play this. Um, I want you to listen. You probably have heard this before. It's, they've been calling a lot. They nest really early here. Um, and then we'll do the mnemonic. There's some crickets in the background. So that nice, clear. So I'll probably play it one more time. Let me make that. So if you, see if you can hear Peter, 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 and see if you can ignore the crickets. Um, it sounded like July in this recording. So yes. Yesterday, I was, we were sitting on the deck at about 7 p.m. It was really nice out still. And this bird was chattering, like um, scolding something. We never did figure out what it was. So birds make a lot of different noises depending on the situation. So it's not always going to make the Peter, Peter, Peter call, um, but it often does. And it's got that beautiful, clear tone to it. Um, and they'll talk back and they'll communicate back and forth. So you'll hear more than one a lot of the time. Um, and another very common feeder bird. And they're, this is a bird that definitely will come in if you pish. Um, they're just very curious about humans and what you're doing in their space. So titmice and black capped chickadees um, and nuthatches will tend to be birds that respond to that um, pishing noise that I talked about. So, oops. All right. All right, everybody's favorite. Uh, Northern Cardinal. Uh, these have also been singing for a while. I think the titmice start a little bit earlier um, and the Cardinals soon join them and they ha do have fairly similar qualities of their song. And this is one where the female and the male definitely um, sing, uh, definitely communicate. And so the second of the calls that I'm going to play has a duet where they're um, a male and a female uh, singing back and forth. Um, and this is a bird that it's pretty fun to find them singing. Um, I think it is really helpful to learn their song if you can watch it a few times. Let's Thank you. 
if I can, okay. I'm trying not to talk over them, but there's things I wanna say. So we're gonna listen for that cheer, 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 and birdie, birdie, birdie. Um, it does a bunch of things, but see if you can pick out those elements. And I'm gonna, there's cheer. I'm gonna try to play the second song here, uh, cause they're duetting. There's birdie, birdie. I've also seen it written out purdy, purdy, um, or witchier, witchier. So they do these little phrases. I'm going to play it one more time. There's a morning dove in the background. Sometimes I like sweet, sweet, sweet on that last part. Um, so it has to be what works for you. Sometimes if you're reading a field guide or looking at something like Merlin, it'll have words or sounds written out and they won't mean anything to you. You don't have to use that. You Use what works for you. Um, I don't have uh, Carolina Wren in here as a sort of three, note, three part call. And I know someone that I used to bird with, their term for it was burrito, burrito which was never what I thought of, but it worked for them. So whatever term works for you for these mnemonics. And I also would caution, like this is, this is a skill and it takes time. And what happens is we don't hear them calling for like four or five or six months. And then it seems like everything is calling at once and it starts to feel a little bit overwhelming. It's a great time of year to practice your calls because things are just starting to arrive and our resident birds like the chickadees and the cardinals are just starting to sing. So there's fewer to learn right now. So you start to build a framework and you can start picking out the ones you know so that by the time the warblers come and we're all totally overwhelmed and there's 25 things singing all at once, you, you can start to, to train your brain to listen for and pick out the ones you know and then start to learn those start to at least recognize the ones you don't know. And if you can um, put words to it or put phrasing to it, it can really help you um, learn those calls. So this is another really common one. Um, sometimes it says its own name, but it doesn't always. This is another one that starts calling really early in January. Those first really sunny, but very cold days in January, you start hearing chickadees and tufted titmice and cardinals calling, at least in the upper Midwest. And you think, okay, spring's not here yet, but it is coming. So it always feels like this nice little burst of uh, spring, even, even when spring is months away. So let's listen to this one. There are some other things in the background calling. I heard cold finches. Um, and so I, I'm, what I'm doing is plucking out the pieces that I know. Oh, there was a gold finch in the background. There's the chickadee. Um, this one, I think the confusing thing is there is a bird called a Phoebe, which says its own name. And, and it sounds nothing like a chickadee. So the chickadee Phoebe is quite sweet. Um, Phoebe, Phoebe, or cheeseburger. Um, and uh, it also will say its own name, not as often as it's doing these other sort of territorial calls right now, um, but you'll often hear this uh, separate from that chickadee or chickadee DD call. And the number of Ds in the call um, has meaning. It communicates something to the bird, which I think is fascinating. Oh, I like seesaw. I haven't heard that. I love getting new mnemonics um, because I teach kids and adults. And so, 
hearing other people's mnemonics is so great because I can use that. Um, and sometimes something works better for one person than it does for another. So if you're, um, if you have other ones, I love them. So, okay. Okay. So I put the Phoebe in here. They are not back yet, unless anybody else has had a really early one. I have not seen them, and they're usually uh, at the Belle Isle Nature Center where I work pretty early on in the season. I would expect probably two more weeks yet. But I picked this one because it's a cool bird that is pretty easy to see, and they're really easy to hear, and they will nest right at your house. Um, they're they're the, the bird that nests like under your eaves or on your um, porch light or something like that. They're very happy nesting right around human habitation. It's a fly catcher. So this is actually a really great one to watch because if you watch them, they'll perch and they'll fly out and grab an insect and they'll come right back to their perch and they'll perch and they'll fly out and grab an insect and come right back to their perch. So they have some interesting behavior that can help you learn them along with uh, the call. Okay, so Jim is agreeing his, his are not back yet either. Um, uh, and yes, they will come back to the same spot to nest year after year after year. So they're a neat bird. Um, I'm going to play it. And so here we're going to be listening for sort of, a, <laughs> to me, it always sounds like a slightly angry um, or like kind of smoky voiced bird. Like, I don't know, it has a has a quality to it that I that cracks me up every time I hear it. There is some there's some geese in the background that'll clear out. of geese in the background there. Um, these are not, these are all taken from um, the Macaulay Library, which I'll talk about a little bit at the end if you're ever looking for bird calls, especially if you've heard something and you're just not totally sure. It can be nice to come back and play the call or if you have a smartphone to play it in the field and we'll talk about that towards the end. So usually says Phoebe, sort of Phoebe, just real short, Phoebe, hence its name. All right, we're gonna do a tricky one. Actually, we're gonna do a couple of tricky ones back to back. Um, these are calling. I have been really appreciating my morning walks because um, it does feel like spring temperature wise, but it also feels like spring because the robins are singing. Um, I think something to note is that our robins are short distance migrants here. We think of them as the first sign of spring, um, but my robins never left. I had them in my backyard all winter long. So they are very much following the food. Um, and so, um, thinking of them as the harbinger of spring is lovely, except they were here all winter. So um, they have a lot of song. Um, I think it's a little bit harder for us to put a mnemonic to it, though I have one. But we're going to listen to this one a few times because I want to compare it uh, to the next bird, which is a bird that a lot of people want to see when it comes back. And sometimes if you hear it, it can help you find it because they do tend to be in the tops of trees. So let's listen to our robin. Um, this is the male uh, with his dark head. The females tend to be um, all sort of light gray. The head is much less distinct in the females. Um, so it's a, a lot of phrases. So the important thing here, yeah, I've got cheer up cheerily um, is actually how I learned it. Um, so thanks, Jim, for putting that in there. Um, 
we're going to listen to it one more time because I want you to, <laughs> here's where we start getting all fancy and I say, listen to the tone. Um, I am not a wine person, like I don't know the oak notes and that kind of thing, but I feel like that is what I'm going to be asking you to do, something quite similar. I want you to listen to the tone and the quality of the song, because we're going to compare this one to the next one, and something that is very helpful can be that you recognize a Robin call, even if you can't put words to it, but that you recognize it enough that you recognize when something sounds similar but isn't quite the same. And I will, you'll understand why in just a minute. Yeah, so I see um, you hear the robins talking when the sun go, goes down. Robins have some really interesting um, evening behaviors um, and that, that sort of short um, chip note that, that we hear a lot of, they do a lot of that at night, um, talking to each other. Um, you'll often see a lot of them go into one tree at night. So they're, they're really interesting birds. We think of them as common, but they have some really interesting behaviors to watch. Um, and if you look, you can um, tell the males apart from the females. Soon, another couple of months, we'll, I guess less than that, a month and a half, we'll have um, the stripy little young, which always looks so grumpy with their big gapes. Um, and so they're just a fun bird to watch. And obviously they have beautiful eggs and are happy to nest in our backyard trees. So let's listen to this and try to listen to sort of the quality of the notes. Um, it's not quite as sweet as some of the other songs. Um, it's not quite as clear and bell-like as some of the other songs. So let's just listen to it. I know it's long. Let's listen to it again and just see if you can start to focus on the, the sort of pitch and tone a little bit. Frogs calling in the background. So it does a lot of that chip note. Okay, we're going to move on to this one because this is a bird, uh, it's a pair. Here's the male and the female. So our rose breasted grosbeak. So they're birds that um, will be coming back in a couple more weeks. Um, they'll come to your feeder for a couple weeks, but they do breed here. Uh, so it is possible to find them, and it is a bird that a lot of people ask me about. And one way to find them is to know their song. So these birds do like to sit pretty high up in the tree, and unfortunately, they come back and then the leaves come out and they get harder and harder to find just with your eyes. Um, but they are not uncommon, so this is very much a bird that all of us could find in our backyards and neighborhood parks. Um, but I want you to listen to the song. So it's going to sound very similar except it's gonna feel a little sweeter. And so sometimes the thing that's most helpful is just to think, okay, it sounds like a robin, but not. Um, and, and that sounds terrible, like how am I gonna ever learn this? But if you can learn the robin because it's, it's calling right now and calling frequently, that it might help you. Um, let's play this one. So that had phrases. They're, they're not the same as the robin. Um, it, has, it actually has very similar mnemonic, um, which I find, I find the mnemonic for this one really hard for my, the way my brain works. Um, but if it helps, I'm going to play it one more time, or at least part of it. You're listening for how sweet it is. sort of clear and clean. <laughs> 
So, yeah, so a Robin, I've, I've heard this too, a Robin that took singing lessons, a drunk Robin that's kind of racing or slurring its phrases, but I think something that it's like cleaner, clearer. Oh yeah, Larry, I've never seen the hip flask either. They keep them tucked under those wings. Um, yeah, a little, I like jazzier. So I'm gonna play the, I'm gonna go back just for a second, just so we can hear that Robin now again. It's a little slowed down. A little raspier on the edges. And then let's just listen to part of this one more time. There. there. A little bit faster than the Robin's phrasing, but that just, there's no rest. And the, the reward is, oh, I like that. The Robin is roomier between phrases. I like that, I haven't heard that one. So the reward is seeing these birds, um, which is always really fun. And I will say, um, I get them in on mixed seed. So I only ever feed, um, we are gonna do Baltimore Oriole, good, good guess. Uh, Cause that's another one that people always ask me about. Um, so just a heads up in a couple of weeks, it's the only time I ever put out the mixed bird seed um, because for whatever reason, the gross beaks and indigo bunting seem to like it. Just for a brief visit in the spring, um, and then I don't feed it the rest of the year um, because the other birds just waste so much seed. So um, it is possible to get them at your feeder. Um, it's always really fun. Love seeing everybody's photos of them. Yeah, I like the alliteration idea, Larry. So I'm seeing such great comments in the chat. So thank you. All right, so as someone predicted, the Baltimore Oriole is next. So another bird that is actually pretty abundant. Um, so last summer I was still living in Royal Oak. We've since moved um, down river. But we, if you know the song of Baltimore Oriole, you will be shocked at how um, abundant they are, even in a neighborhood. Um, but they do like to be up in the tops of trees um, and their nests tend to be pretty high up um, and they make those beautiful pouch nests, those hanging pendulous nests. So learning this call and learning their chatter um, can be really helpful because you'll be out and you'll think, wait, there's a Baltimore Oriole. And then you'll look way up and then you'll be able to see, you think seeing this big black and bright orange bird would be really easy. It is not always easy um, because they're often pretty high up. Uh, if you want to feed them, I put my oranges out in April 15th, so just a couple more weeks. Um, and I, my trick for that is um, I put it in my suet feeder so the squirrels can't steal my oranges and that has worked really, really well for me. Um, I do have an Oriole feeder too, but uh, I like the, I like the repurposing the suet cage because I stopped feeding suet once it warms up. So this is the male. Um, Again, a bird that is a lot of fun to see and hear. And if you're lucky enough to find a spot where they're nesting, um, watching the parents feed the young in that pendulous nest is really, really neat. So we're gonna listen to this. So I don't really have a mnemonic for this. Um, things that I think are really helpful are, um, so he does these little intro phrases. And then that really pretty stretch of song and then he chatters like he's real mad. They always sound like they're scolding something. So you get this beautiful, clear series of notes, this really pretty little, and then they chatter at you. So um, if you can train your ear to hear that, I promise you, you will find Baltimore Orioles this year. Um, I shouldn't ever promise anyone a bird, but they are much more common than I think people realize. Um, and you'll, 
this is one where if you learn the call um, and that little bit of song, you it will make your life so much easier so that you can find them. Um, and again, they should be back in the next like three weeks. So that's pretty exciting. I'm gonna play this one more time because it's just a short clip. Oops, this one. Chatter scold gets me every time because it's like he's so close to such a beautiful song and then he just can't quite it's like just irritated at the end or rushing or something. Uh, Brittany, I like bounce, bounce, bounce at the beginning. Um, I think that's that's a good one. I picked this one. So this is not a bird you're gonna find at your feeder, but it's such a neat one to learn because if you go into any park or woodland um, with a nice sized bit of woods. This is such a sound of summer um, and it's such a neat call and it's a bird that is a little bit harder to see. They tend to be high up as well um, and you can see the red eyes in this photo for which it is named. Um, this one has a really fun mnemonic but I'm going to play it first and then we'll do the mnemonic and then when you go out this summer in June or July this is such a summertime song to me in a in a patch of woods and so it's a really nice one to learn um, because they're pretty easy to find by hearing. Um, you're not going to see it at your bird feeder, but it's a neat little one to learn. Okay, so I see um, choppy phrases. So we're gonna play this one a couple of times. This one always sounds like a conversation, like it's asking a question, answering a question, asking a question, answering a question. So I've heard, um, here I am, where are you? Up here, in a tree, and then over and over and over. Um, it, uh, so I'm gonna play it one more time so you can hear that up and down, up and down, and they're just little phrases. Um, with, yeah, see me, here I am, I've heard that one too. So again, there's lots of versions of the mnemonic, so pick one that sticks for you. So that, I think that's delightful. Okay, we're gonna do this one. This is one that fools people sometimes. I know, like if you have the backyard bird feeder, you probably, a lot of times people will ask me about owls and say, I'm hearing them every morning. Um, and then they do this call and I realize, oh, they don't, they don't actually have owls. They have um, equally delightful morning doves. So let's listen to them. And this is a bird that's fun to watch while it's calling. It's its whole chest uh, really puffs out. Um.
So that is a delightful, um, and yeah, I'm seeing, we're gonna talk about apps in just a few minutes. Yes, and so dove wings make noise. So there are um, quite a few birds whose wings make noise. Um, we'll talk about an important one at the end. Uh, but I think it's nice to know that that is actually morning doves that you're hearing. Um, I think people, the, the mnemonic for this might be something with who in it. And I think people associate that so much with how we've written out owl calls or sort of cartoon owls before. So I'm gonna play this one, which has also been really active. Um, they are nesting right now and we should not be calling them, I don't think at this point in time. But let's play this call. This is our great horned owl. This is a duet between a male and female pair. <laughs> and I think the robin outside my window can hear this. It's quite upset all of a sudden. <laughs> Mnemonic for this one, and I totally appreciate that people don't always hear mnemonics because I it does not always work for me either. Um, so the mnemonic for Great Hornell, it's a big booming call. You often hear it in the evening starting in December. Um, you'll hear it in the morning sometimes, but I definitely hear them more at night. Um, big booming call. It's who's awake, me to really deep. Um, but they are a nest right now, so we do not want to be playing calls to them. And I saw a few people in the chat um, had mentioned that they were seeing them. Um, I know locally there's a um, there's a pretty easy to see nest at Lake St. Clair Metro Park, and they lead some guided hikes back there. Um, but there, this is a bird that you can see in just about maybe not the deep desert, but just about anywhere in the U.S. It's, a, it's so it's a neat bird for all of us. Okay, I think I just have two more and then a couple of thoughts on apps and then there'll be time for questions. Um, I wanted to put this in here uh, because this is a bird that we all see, even if we don't go birding. If you are driving down the highway, just about anywhere, you will see a red-tailed hawk. They're sitting on power uh, the poles, they're sitting on fences. They're also pretty vocal um, and they are about to nest. So they've been really vocal around here. So this might be a little bit loud and I apologize for that, but let's play this. There's no mnemonic for this. It's just a They'll do this back and forth. Um, Peggy, there's, sorry, let me hush the hawk for a second. There's not really a mnemonic for the morning dove. Um, uh, so the red-tailed hawk here, if you're thinking, huh, that sounds like what I've always thought of a bald eagle. That's because in every movie you've ever seen where there is a bald eagle shown, they are playing a red-tailed hawk call. And I'm going to play you the bald eagle call next. If you haven't heard it, it's somewhat delightful and I have found eagles because they were making this noise um, for such a big bird. It's a rather um, uh, wimpy call. I don't know what to say about it. Um, and they are also nesting right now. So the eagles on Belle Isle have been really active. Um, I don't actually know that they're on the nest yet. Uh, they've been around the nest, but I'm not there every day. So let's play this. If you visit, the, if you're local, if you visit the Detroit Zoo, we have several non-releasable eagles um, together and you can hear them often. Um, they're often making noise and you will be shocked and amazed that they make that kind of noise. So really and truly when you're watching a movie or a TV show and they show a bald eagle, they play a red-tailed red hawk call. And I learned fairly recently that not only do they play a red-tailed hawk call, 
it's the same call from the same captive hawk, like just reused over and over and over again. So yes, um, lots of places to see rehabbed birds. Um, there is a red-tailed hawk at Oakwoods Metro Park who is really active and um, sometimes vocal. There's also a great horned owl there. Um, so you can see some of these birds up close and perhaps hear them calling. But I've been out near water. I mean, I live in the, I live on an island in the Detroit River. Sometimes you hear the eagles before you see them. So that is a call that can be useful. Uh, I did want to mention blue jays are excellent mimics of red-tailed hawk calls. Um, so you can be fooled uh, by the blue jays. They'll make this perfect scream and you're looking and looking and looking, and then you'll realize, oh, I'm looking right past this blue jay who's making this scream. So let's see. Okay. I'm going to play this uh, really briefly because this is very helpful. So these are um, brewers, blackbirds chasing a red-tailed hawk. And this is a, a um, behavior called mobbing. And it can be really useful to us as birders because if you hear a lot of blue jays or a lot of small songbirds or a lot of crows sort of making a ruckus, they are potentially leading you to a hawk or an owl. So they don't, they want to scare away those um, raptors, those predator birds that might eat their eggs or young. It can be really useful. We've found screech owls that way. I've definitely found Cooper's hawks that way. Um, so the, young, the littler birds are just making a ruckus and drawing in other little birds and maybe dive bombing them, maybe just surrounding them in a tree until they fly. So let's listen to this for just a second. All those cliches. If you are an eBird user, today's um, eBird, the photo of the day, uh, my husband sent it to me knowing we were doing this talk, uh, was um, an owl being mobbed. So it's definitely behavior that the birders know about and pay attention to. Um, okay, so when shouldn't we use playback? When shouldn't we call birds? Anytime the birds are on the nest, um, <laughs> they're defending, you don't, want, you don't want them to waste energy coming to see your call because they think it's an a interloper. So if it's mid-May to mid-August, but probably should not be playing using playback, use it very judiciously. It can be a helpful tool. We don't want to stress birds out and we don't want to do it in places where there's a ton of people um, day after day after day. So the birds are reacting to calls day after day after day. So you, ju you just want to do it really judiciously. I use it when I, sometimes when I can't place a bird, if I'm like, was that a whatever? And I want to play it for myself. Um, but birds do react or can react. And so you just want to be really careful about that. So for owls, um, it's probably too late in the season. We probably should not be doing playback. That is something that lots of people do on guided hikes in December and January. But now that they're on nest, we want to leave them to be on nest and use their energy to feed and keep warm their eggs and their young. So, um, okay. So what are your next steps for learning about bird calls? Um, I am teaching a two hour workshop on the 11th. It's free, it's part of my five part bird watching class. So if you really want to do, we get into some of the warblers um, if you want to join that, you can find it at the Detroit Zoo or Belle Isle Nature Center um, and just register for it. It's a Sunday afternoon. Um, people were asking about apps. So if you do a Google search uh, in the app store for bird call apps, there are so many. Um, the one that I would most recommend right now is Merlin. Um, so that is Cornell Lab of University, Cornell Lab of Ornithology's app, and they just updated it in early March, I think, with new um, audio files. It's free, or at least most of it is free. I think you can always, there's some purchases you can make. Um, so that is helpful. That is one where you can take photographs or describe the bird that you're seeing. You can listen to audio. Um, if you are using eBird, you can actually submit your eBird checklist right through the app. So that can be really handy. I have a confession to make. I don't use any of the apps. Um, I actually have the 
CDs of the Eastern birds um, downloaded into my music files on my phone. So then if I don't have the internet um, or a good connection, I can still play the calls. That has worked for me. So there are a plethora of field guides um, that have an audio component. The um, Peterson guide in the center is pretty new and that has, um, I think there's sonograms, so the, the visual image of the call. And I will tell you up front, it does not work for me at all. I don't, I don't see sound the way he does, but if that works for you, it is a great resource. It just came out maybe 2019, it's pretty new. Um, and obviously make sure you get the birds for your region. If you're east of the Mississippi or west of the Mississippi, you wanna make sure you're getting your common birds. I find this incredibly helpful pre-COVID when we were traveling. If I was gonna be going out west, I don't know those calls as well. Give me a really helpful tool to listen to. I think the caveat here is I'm not saying just press play and start at the beginning. <laughs> So figure out which section makes the most sense um, and start there and don't try to learn a ton at once. Our brains are not wired for that, especially something like this where it's sound. I think very few people have the wiring to like retain a bunch of new calls or songs all at once. So do a few at a time. You can kind of skip the ducks because most of us are not identifying ducks and waterfowl by their calls, unless it's really interesting to you. If you're a waterfowl hunter or spending a lot of time fishing or something, go for it. But a lot of times the birds are much further away. You're gonna want things like um, your backyard songbirds, your warblers, that kind of thing. And then don't try to do all the warblers at once because you'll overwhelm yourself. Um, oh yeah, the biggest thing. Go outside, watch them, listen to them, go with people. Auto Detroit Audubon has a woodcock field trip coming up, which is a delightful way to learn a new bird. If you haven't watched um, the sky dance of the woodcock, they are calling now, speaking of really interesting um, bird calls. Um, but wherever you are, there's probably a birding organization. And I realize it's COVID, people's field trips are very scaled down and socially distanced and it's very different, but going with experts or people that know what to listen for and how to help you um, pick things out is extremely helpful. Um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology has a whole, it has a library of songs and calls from all over the country. So birds can have dialects just like people can. So you can listen to them. Um, you can take another course, like a full course on like just warbler songs. Um, there's lots of opportunities there. They also have a really wonderful um, feeder cams, which I just love to watch. Uh, it's good practice and it's really fun. And then just really and truly, even if you're just sitting on your deck or your balcony and you're hearing birds, try to find them and watch them. It makes an enormous uh, difference in retaining those calls. And also don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, we all do it all the time. Uh, even expert birders will hear a piece of a song and think it's one thing and then realize, oh, that wasn't what I thought it was. It's some something completely different. Or a blue jay will be a mimic and you'll get totally thrown by that. I think, and that's the song Sparrow, which I was going to throw in here, but it felt like I had spent so much time talking. That, um, that's a fun one to learn. I'm gonna stop sharing and try to answer any questions. Um, um, thank you so much first, Erin. That was so, that was wonderful. Um, we really don't have many questions. We did have, we've answered a couple as they've come in. Um, we did have one question on Facebook asking what the background, what the other bird calls were during the chickadee. I think there were a couple different ones. Um, um, let me go back while I'm, because I, there's okay. one, I know there's a goldfinch calling in the background of one, but I can't remember now if that was the chickadee or something else. They said it sounded like jungle bird to them. So I wasn't sure what oh. that like, referred to. And while you're looking, I wanted to also apologize to those of you that were not able to get in at the beginning. Um, we had some Zoom technical problems. So we will be sending out a recording of this to everybody that registered 
I will do that as soon as possible, um, probably tomorrow. We put those on YouTube as well? Yes, they'll be on YouTube. That's where they will be, but I'll send a link out to everybody. Thank you. We're so glad. Thanks. I'm glad I got in at the end. Awesome <laughs> job. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming. So I'm not, I'm not sure what the Facebook question was about. Oh. So there's a bunch of stuff calling in the background, so I'm not sure specifically. Okay. Um, I'm not, she's, she might not be there anymore. Um, and it, it is from the Macaulay Library, if anyone, it's, which is part of Cornell. So you, you can just look up, um, it'll take you to All About Birds. If you have any questions about any of your common birds, um, that is a great resource. It's free. Um, you can get lots of pictures, but then they have many different recordings. So if something has songs or um, calls or chatter, you know, you can get all those different little nuances. So. Oh, a flicker, that's good. A flicker does have a jungle like call. I, um, <laughs> this is a funny story. I worked at Isle Royal National Park for three years as a backcountry ranger. And one morning, um, some visitors came up to me and said, I didn't know you had monkeys out here. <laughs> we don't have monkeys out here. It turned, I finally, I mean, this was, it was like seven in the morning. My brain was not caught up yet, but it, we finally realized they were hearing pileated woodpeckers, which has a very jungle-like call. It just took me a very long time to understand what we were talking about, so. Pileators sound like monkeys? Yeah, sort of a tropical screaming sound, that high kek, 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 kek. So. <gasps> oh. Well, we did have a question about attracting Pileated woodpeckers. If you know, okay. they, they've had a brief visit by a pileated woodpecker and wondered if there was a way that you knew of to get them to stay, they've tried suet fever. Have, have a big, beautiful patch of forest with a lot of dead trees in it. Um, uh, yeah, they they'll come to suet. Um, I don't I don't know that they'll stick around. Um, so. There was one on Gross Eel a year ago at the Christmas bird count. <laughs> we keep right trying down, to right we down. keep trying to turn our flickers into uh, um, pileated woodpeckers, and they don't cooperate. You hear it in the distance. You're like, "Oh, that's going to be a pilot." No, sounds a, a lot alike. I think it's interesting. Pileated is just a loud, more raucous flicker. <laughs> Uh, so my trick for that is flicker is very even. It's flicker, flicker, flicker. And pileated seems to sort of speed up. I mean, yes, it's much louder too. When you hear it, you're like, oh, obviously that's what it is. But yeah. flickers are really e even in their calling. Yeah, Jack, you're right. Pileated's cover a huge territory. So I think they're just visiting. I think we just have to be re feel really grateful that they stopped by and ate our suet when they come, so. Well, yeah, I have a pair. I have a pair of flickers in my yard right now. I really want them to nest here. So, oh yeah, Joan. We also live on Gross Eel, so you should come on our Gross Eel Nature and Land Conservancy walks. Um, the May one, whose date is the 9th or tenth, is focused on birds, and you can just find that on the Gross Eel Nature and Land Conservancy website. It's free. Anyone is welcome. There is a toll bridge, unfortunately, if you don't live on the island. Um, so. And really and truly reach out and come to the next free class because I'll cover a little bit more on April 11th. And if you register for that and you can't be there for that two hours, I do send it out so you'll get you'll get the video. Um, so if there's stuff that you wish that I'd covered, I might get to it in the two hour class. So, so I'll include a link to that when I send Thanks. an email out to everybody with the recordings. Um, so I think that's all our questions. Thank you again, Erin. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, we do have more webinars coming up. Um, we have one next week with Jim Bull, uh, biodiversity of the Detroit River. And in April, we have uh, one on wood, um, hummingbirds and a couple on making um, bird-friendly space in your backyard and native plants. Um, so that one was very popular last year. So we're repeating those. So again, everyone have a wonderful evening. Happy birding. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you all so much.
I love that the cats got into this yeah. too. That's hilarious. <laughs> that's great. Thanks, ladies. Thank you so Thank much you. for coming out. <laughs>